and welcome to this session 3A, Asphalt Mixture Performance and Testing. My name is Fernando Moreno. I'm professor at the University of Granada, and I will be the chair of this session. This session will be divided in two parts. During the first part, we are going to have three amazing presentations, which is going to deal with high performance asphalt material for racing condition in subtropical climates. Secondly, we are going to talk about the importance of external and internal conditions such as temperature, low frequency, or air voids in the dynamic modulus of asphalt concrete bases. And to close the first part, we are going to talk about end result verification for performance based Freud delivery. At the end of this first part of the session, we are going to have the opportunity to address questions to the speaker by using Slido, the Q&A text box that you have in your platform. When this 10 minutes Q&A session will be finished, the second part of our session is going to start where we are going to address other three very interesting presentations that are going to be focused on the optimization of bitumen emulsions to achieve the best bone layers, the presentation of a new digital image processing method for the determination of bitumen coverage. And finally, at the end, we are going to have the main outcome of the Reland Technical Committee 237 on the affinity between aggregates and bituminous binders. Similarly, that in the first part of the session, at the end of this second part, we are going to have the opportunity to address different questions to, to the speaker by using the Q&A text box that you have in your platform. The first speaker of the session will be Laszlo Peso. Laszlo holds a master's degree in civil engineering and a PhD degree in asphalt payment technology. He's a highly qualified, skilled professional civil engineer with 20 years experience in asphalt mix design and quality control, material characterization, payment performance assessment, and the implementation of innovative technologies. He has spent many years in the asphalt industry and the research sector providing implemented research outcomes both in Australia and abroad. He's now payment manager at Fulton Hogan Infrastructure Services, where he developed and implements enhanced product for producers such as uh, high modulus asphalt mixture, high wrap and pour and a pour asphalt mixture. His presentation is entitled High Performing Asphalt for Rising Condition in Subtropical Climate, the Australian Experience. Dear Laszlo, the floor is yours. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. This is Laszlo here from Brisbane in Australia. And uh, I'm going to give you a, a quick rundown on asphalt mix in a subtropical climate for racing condition. A quick overview of the presentation is just a history and past performance. Uh, we will touch base on V8 supercar setup, climatic conditions in Queensland. Uh, a few words on the mixed design objectives and methodology. And as part of that, we're going to touch base on the binder selection. And finally, some words on the paving process. So the V8 supercars, it's a very Australian, very unique uh, racing event. It is more popular than the Formula One because there isn't just one uh, event in a year. There are multiple locations, multiple sites. And uh, we collected a lot of uh, experience on the Gold Coast. Gold Coast is the uh, playground of Queensland. And the site is very unique uh, because uh, it is not a dedicated racetrack. It is the city streets, uh, which is turned into a city circuit. And uh, barriers and uh, fences are going up. And this is where they are racing. As you see on the on these two photos uh, before and after the race, uh, you get a lot of binder wear off. And this is a very harsh uh, racing condition. Uh, in the past, there were uh, experiences that 
if air voids were above six percent then it was always linked to poor in-situ performance if the air void was below six percent uh, it didn't really or not necessarily uh, provided a good performance. So this was a, a pretty big challenge for us. With uh, racing surfaces, uh, the predominant failure mode is the uh, loss of mastic and the loss of aggregate. When you start seeing this during the race, it won't take really long until the whole surface will disintegrate. And unfortunately, in the past, it did happen that race uh, events running on the national television had to be stopped. And that is a pretty big stress on uh, the organizer. So there is a lot of scrutiny around designing asphalt mixes for race conditions. How about the V8 supercars? Uh, they are very unique uh, race cars. They use uh, soft or hard slick tires and the drivers tend to be driving on the same path, not deviating uh, a millimeter. These uh, cars are relatively heavy and they are sitting on a relatively narrow set of tires. Their suspensions are set up in a way that on chicanes, the cars tend to be on two wheels and because they don't have differentials, uh, they provide a lot of shear forces on turns. Uh, the tires could reach uh, a temperature up to 130 degree. Now this is uh, linked with uh, the high pavement temperatures in southeast Queensland. That's in that's Brisbane or the Gold Coast. Even in autumn, on this chart, you see an autumn uh, temperature distribution in the pavement. On the top 20 millimeter, you will still get 50, 55 degree, even in the middle of autumn. So we are getting hot temperatures uh, throughout the whole year. Now, um, on the mixed design objective, we had to we had to meet a, a few uh, items. We had to provide a stable and durable mix for all weather conditions and which withstands the extreme horizontal forces, shear forces, but also provides a surface for 362 days throughout the year for normal road traffic, that's trucks and normal light vehicles, because uh, the majority of the year, these um, roads are being used as normal uh, city streets. The in-situ air would uh, had to be uh, low, six to six, uh, two to six percent, and you can already gauge this is a fairly low uh, air weight content for uh, road conditions. So we had to keep it in mind that rotting shouldn't be an issue, and uh, we had to provide good interlock between the particles to avoid loss of aggregates with a with a relatively high mastic content. And we had to make sure that the mix itself is workable, that we can compact it to a low air void. Our mix design methodology used uh, the volumetric part and used the um, performance-based and performance-related testing. I'm not going to talk about the volumetric part. You can read about that in the paper. On the performance-based and performance-related testing, we use the particle loss, wheel tracking, and resilient modulus to provide a uh, upfront knowledge about uh, the in-situ performance of the mix. For such an asphalt mix, we had to use a, spe a specific binder. And for that binder, we used the nature of, uh, of the bitumen that it's, uh, it has a viscoelastic uh, behavior. On that basis, we developed um, a, a specific binder, which has a fairly high complex modulus um, and a fairly low phase angle. So as you can see, this is a modified binder. We added a few other conventional test, conventional test results to this table. If you wanted, you can uh, benchmark uh, this binder against your uh, local high-performing binders. 
We also provided this table in the paper. It provides you a comp with a comparison uh, with a plane binder. That's a C-170 in Australia. That would be a PAN 70 slash 100 in Europe. A, an A35P, that is a plastomeric modified binder. An A10E, it is a popular um, uh, elastomeric binder in Australia. And finally, the newly uh, developed race binder. Now, at the end of this table, you see the, the, the G star over sinus delta values. And you can gauge that the newly developed binder uh, has a very high value for this property. And that indicates a very high uh, uh, resistance against rutting. So we were uh, quite confident with the mix design and with the binder selection. And uh, as I mentioned, we uh, carried out uh, the performance-based and related testing, and we were happy with the overall mix performance. Now, that's uh, just one side or half, uh, half of the journey uh, when you are uh, done with the mix design. You also need to make sure that this mix is manufactured and placed on the roads correctly. And as you can gauge, there is no room for error for racing conditions. On the left-hand side picture, you see a, um, a paving um, exercise on one of the tight turns. And this is uh, on, as you see, it's one of the city roads. On this particular location, we only used uh, one set of paving gear. Uh, because we could uh, use a warm joint and pave the other half of the road uh, straight away, providing a good longitudinal joint. On this other example, on the left-hand side photo, you see on a wider, longer run, we had to use two set of gears uh, in echelon paving for racing condition that's fairly normal. And uh, you need to provide uh, with this uh, setup a good uh, riding quality, a good longitudinal joint, and an overall consistency across the whole mat. On the right hand side picture, that is the, uh, the same city circuit. This is the pit lane. And I really hope that this uh, short presentation uh, provided you some insight about uh, designing and placing uh, asphalt for racing conditions in a hot tropical climate, sorry, subtropical climate. I uh, thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laszlo. Very, very nice presentation. The second speaker we hope that will be will be Nicolas Birch. Nicolas is civil engineer from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. He also holds a master thesis in airfield pavements domain and a PhD in the field of warm asphalt. Since 2011, he's co-director in the consulting company Nibux in Switzerland. And since 2017, he's also professor in transport infrastructure and group leader in pavement infrastructure since 2018 at the Bern University of Applied Science. He is also a PR Swiss delegate in Committee 4.1 Payments and FAHR Research Coordinator. His presentation is entitled Statistical Analysis of the Effect of Temperature, Load Frequency, and Aribolid on dynamic modulus of road-based asphalt concrete. Dear Nicolas, please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I'm going to present you our paper, which is a statistical analysis of the effect of temperature, load, frequency, or air void on dynamic modulus of road-based asphalt concrete. I have to say that I'm not, I'm not really the, the researcher. The researcher who did the research is Dr. Eshan Solaitan from the ETS in Montreal. Just a few words about the context. On the left-hand side, you can see collected data by the Ministry of Transport of Quebec that illustrate daily asphalt temperature history. It can be seen that asphalt temperature are higher than the hair temperature, although they both follow, let's say, the same trend. 
according to the database gather in long-term pavement performances in cold region, which is uh, in the central figure, asphalt pavement undergoes a high number of daily free so cycle. That severe temperature variation, which seasonally may reach to 60 degree, results in the appearance of premature failure in terms of low temperature or thermal fatigue cracking. To go back to the free so cycle damage, which is the core of our research, as everybody knows, the free so cycle mechanism is defined as water penetration inside the asphalt pores accompanied by the variation of positive and negative environment temperature. Damage induced by free so cycle is caused by changing the water into ice particle, which in turn leads to the expansion of water volume and the loss of adhesion between the asphalt and adjacent aggregates. So after a large number of free so cycle, stress decreases the material tensile strength and cause micro damage on the surface. This accumulation of micro damage will deteriorate the asphalt aggregate bond, allow water to enter, enter in the pavement system and then increase the stripping of aggregates. Now, which are, what are the questions we want to address? First, we want to see if the changes in free so cycle affect the complex modulus. And then how this free so cycle affect the mechanical behavior of the asphalt mixture and which parameter has the greatest effect on the complex modulus. Finally, we want to see how the changes can be justified by the temperature, frequency, and air void content. The methodology developed is quite it's quite simple. First, we want to simulate the daily rapid free so cycle by applying 150 and 300 free so cycle as set out in ISTM method. Then on the sample, we want to perform complex modulus test according to Quebec's test method. And then we want to study the dynamic modulus of specimens before and after free so cycle test in relation to changes in air void content. Now we go in the lab part for the specimen preparation and test. Um, so first four slabs uh, have been uh, compacted with the French laboratory slab compactor. And in these slabs, the symmetrical specimen were cored and then trimmed to a height of 150 millimeter and diameter of 74 millimeter. Then once the cores have been obtained, a saturation process was conducted um, to introduce liquid the void from the test standard specified by Etsy method for moisture resistance measurements. Um, we can see that uh, the, the, the saturation process is a bit, let's say, a bit tricky um, to solve the, the problem because we want really to, to get the desired saturation level. Uh, a constant low pressure of vacuum is required to reach a certain percentage of saturation of the specimen without creating micro damage. In this research, the specimen have been divided in two groups. A first reference group was kept in the, in the, the air dry as control reference specimen, and the second group was conditioned through vacuum saturation. After the saturation process, each conditioned sample were submitted to 150 and 300 free so cycle as set forth in ASTM method. The ASTM method applied is uh, called standard test method for resistance, for resistance of concrete to rapid freezing and sewing. Basically, the method apply a cooling and heating rate, rate of 4.5 degrees per minute. And for each free so cycle, two different temperature level were targeted, which is minus 18 at six degree. So the temperature remained constant for a period of one and a half hour at each level of temperature. Then the dynamic modulus, complex modulus tests were performed before and after conducting the rapid free so cycle. For the complex modulus, there, there are three major parameters, which are the air void content of the sample between 0.8 and 6%, the frequency between 0.03 Hertz and 10 Hertz, and the test temperature between minus 35 degree and plus 35 degree. I come to the results. You can see on the left-hand side, you can see the result of the cold cold diagram, which express significant differences before and after the effect of 300 free so cycle while the diagram does not show significant differences between the reference and after 150 free so cycle. The central figure show the complex modulus results in the black curve diagram, and it can be seen that the phase angle reduces in black curve diagram after reaching a maximum value. In this study, 
the difference of the maximum value before and after free cell cycle can be explained as the stripping failure due to the loss of the cohesion. On the right hand side, you can see a master curve. And as it is indicated in the graph, the top part of the master curve at high frequency, low temperature is equal for all the reference and condition mix after 150 free cell cycle. This means that the maximum stiffness value of the mix was not changed after this 150 free cell cycle, while the bottom part of the master curve at low frequencies, high temperature, which is associated with the minimum asphalt mixture stiffness value has been changed after 150 free cell cycle. Now we can see some more results. Uh, in, in this slide, you can see the changes in dynamic modulus before and after free cell cycle in relation to changes air void content. So each graph corresponds to a given air void content. The test results revealed that the dynamic modulus after 300 free cell cycle were noticeably lower in each level of temperature compared with two other test conditions as the air void contents went up. Furthermore, at very cold temperature, minus 32 degree or high temperature, 37.8 degree, the drop in dynamic modulus from the reference case with no free cell cycle was significant, while in medium temperature, 7.7 .7 degree, the difference in the dynamic modulus among the test conditions were not outstanding. In addition, the differences between dynamic modulus in dry condition and after 150 free cell cycle were not significant. Finally, uh, another analysis has been performed in order to predict the dynamic modulus after 300 free cell cycle based on the independent variable studied in this research. This means the air void, uh, the air void, the different frequencies and different testing temperature. To achieve this, a statistical analysis has been performed in order to seek a meaningful relationship which justifies the changes in dynamic modulus. In this context, according to the value obtained here in the lab, uh, according to the coefficient of the determination that you can see here, a square of 92, a linear regression is able to predict the dynamic modulus based on the changes in temperature, frequency, and air void, which is quite important. Finally, I can say that in cold region, a large number of free cell cycles considerably influence the dynamic modulus of road-based asphalt, while its effect in dry condition and low number of free cell cycles is negligible. At high level of air void in asphalt mixtures, dynamic modulus is tangibly lower in very cold or hot temperature. And as I just explained, the linear regression model is a suitable tool in order to predict the dynamic modulus of road-based asphalt with great certainty in any combination of temperature, frequency, and air void content and in high number of free cell cycle. With this, I would like to thank you and I would like to congratulate again, the Dr. Eshan Solaitan. Thank you very much, Nicolas very clear presentation. The third presentation of this session will be carried out by Bergus Schluer and Natasha Pura. Bergus Schluer holds a master's degree in road construction and pavement engineering at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. And nowadays he managed the R plus D department quality research and support at the Road and Infrastructure Division of Royal Boscolis Westminster. Natasha Puran achieved her master's degree in Road and Railway Engineering at Delft University of Technology. After finishing, Natasha has started working as a research consultant at the Arcus D Department at the Road and Infrastructure Division of the Royal Boscolis Westminster. Their work at the QRS Department it's been really important to achieve the transition in the payment construction industry from implicit craftsmanship to explicit industrialization. The presentation that they are going to, to carry out is entitled End Result Verification for Performance Based Project Delivery. Dear Berwich, dear Natasha, the floor is yours. Thanks. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Berwich Sliver, and together with Natasha Puran, my colleague, we will present our work with respect to end result verification of asphalt. Uh, end result verification of asphalt is to assess whether the quality of delivered asphalt meets the specifications by performing fundamental tests on material from the field. In 2008, the Netherlands has chosen for the fundamental approach 
of the European standards for the specification of asphalt. However, today still we do our quality control and acceptance of asphalt uh, based on uh, checking only the recipe and the density of a finished asphalt layer. So why do we need entry salt verification? This is because there could be a variety in constituent materials. There could be an increasing percentage of wrap material in, uh, in our asphalt, the large scale use of additives and the circular use of base material in, uh, in our new asphalt mixes. Uh, all these parameters can have a large influence on the mechanical, mechanical properties of the asphalt. In the Netherlands, the four point bending test is used uh, in the type test, and uh, these results are also used in our pavement design. Uh, but uh, to do the verification of, of the uh, properties for, uh, of asphalt uh, from the field, we only can use uh, cores in the uh, cyclic ITT test. So comparing and verifying lab and field properties is a challenge for stiffness and fatigue. Yeah, and this challenge um, isn't only because the, the types of specimens are different, it's because uh, the two tests, the four-point bending test and the cyclic ITT test, they have uh, different characters. Four-point bending test is displacement controlled and the cyclic ITT test is force controlled, which, me which means that the test samples undergo a different path to failure. Uh, in the four-point bending tests, uh, little small micro cracks occur, not visible to the eye, and uh, ITT samples, they split in half and they do not have any uh, stiffness left. Because of this difference in character, we probably need an energy-based uh, energy analysis method to compare the two results directly. So five, year, five to six years ago now, I think, we, uh, we discovered uh, the publication by Shannon Carpenter from 2007, in which they proposed their the RDEC analysis method. RDEC stands for Ratio of Dissipated Energy Change. And uh, the essential principle from, uh, in this analysis method is that uh, energy dissipation in one cycle is very much dependent, dependent on the energy dissipation in the previous cycle. So when we, uh, and when we apply this uh, this starting point to the fatigue data, we see that the RDEC takes a bathtub shaped form, and this bathtub can be divided into three stages: the first one, the second one, the third one, um, and this second stage. Shannon Carpenter deemed the plateau stage, and this plateau stage is said to uh, be representative for the, intrins the intrinsic. Um, resistance to fatigue failure of a material. So, be, uh, mostly because of this starting point, we thought this uh, theory was, it, it was very logical. Um, it made sense to us. So we decided to take this analysis method and apply it on DSR mortar fatigue test data. Uh, and we did. Um, and what we found out is that although we find this theory very elegant, we do not fully agree with some of the starting points Shannon Carpenter have described. So the first and I think the most important uh, starting point we do not agree with is the end of life criterion Shannon Carpenter have said. They have, they have said that uh, the end of life criterion is the number of load repetitions at the 50% stiffness reduction. And as I said, we tried out this method on uh, DSR mortar fatigue tests. And what we found was that if we, um, if we test the same mortar, so we keep the same scent and filler fraction, but we only change the type of polymer modified bitumen, um, we see that the results of the fatigue tests here you see a typical fatigue test result. Here we see the yellow line, the dissipated energy, and the blue line is the calculated RDEC. The red dot represents uh, the stiffness reduction of 50%. Um, if I put all the three results together, you will see that 
dependent on the type of polymer modified bitumen, the stiffness reduction to 50% can occur in phase one, it can occur in phase two, or it can occur in phase three, which means that the stiffness reduction is not at all representative uh, to determine end of fatigue life. What we propose is to shift the end of life criterion to the transition from phase two to phase three, and we have called it NF, NF micro. The second starting point we are not um, we, we do not agree with is the way the plateau value is calculated. Uh, Shannon, Shannon Carpenter proposed a fitting procedure. Uh, and we have also tried this fitting procedure on the DSR mortar fatigue tests. Uh, and we came to the conclusion that this fitting procedure, it, uh, it over and underestimates uh, the plateau value. And this is also dependent on the type of polymer modified uh, bitumen. Uh, here are some illustrations of this over and underestimation. What we propose is uh, because we have shifted the end of life criterion to NF micro, so the transition from phase two to phase three, we propose to calculate plateau value by taking the average of RDEC um, in the second stage. And based on these starting points, we have automated this RDEC analysis method and we have named it QRS RDEC. Um, we calculate plateau value as I just uh, described and NF micro is uh, determined by calculating this cumulative standard deviation of RDEC and taking the number of low repetitions at the minimum of this cumulative standard deviation. With this method, now we have analyzed uh, some fatigue data from uh, type tests, but also from material from the road. And Barry will um, take you through some of those results. So I will take you to some, through some results of uh, the end result verification. Here in this figure, you can see the results of a type test, which, which uh, was done in 2016. The same, the type test was repeated on the same asphalt mix in 2019. These results are also in the figure, uh, in the figure. And uh, we added the results of the cyclic ITT test uh, based on the material from 2019. We, uh, on course with a 100 millimeter diameter and course with 150 millimeter diameter. And as you can see, the results uh, very much look alike. Here, uh, I will take you to the results as we report them uh, nowadays at Boscalis uh, of uh, the end result verification with the QRS RDEC method for a certain uh, uh, asphalt uh, layer. Uh, first, uh, you can see the results of the standard quality control, which in fact is uh, the uh, checking the recipe of the asphalt and the density. Uh, here you can see the results. And what we add with the end result verification are the results of uh, the me uh, measurements of the stiffness, which is in the right, uh, uh, which is reported in the right table. And in the figure on the, the, figure on the left side, uh, the results of uh, the fatigue are presented. Um, and in the figure, you can see the results of uh, four point uh, bending tests on material uh, samples, which are cut from material from the field. And uh, the results of the, the original type tests are also added in the figure. And again, the results very much look alike. Finally, we also uh, determine the master curve of the bitumen, which is attract, extracted from uh, material from the field, as we think uh, the, this uh, information will be helpful to do the prediction of uh, the asphalt uh, properties, the asphalt properties, the mechanical properties of the asphalt. So to uh, go from uh, end result verification to functional delivery with the QRS RDEC method, and uh, by functional delivery, I mean the use of end result verification for contractual assessment and acceptance of completed asphalt work. We still have to do some, uh, some work. Here you can see that, uh, as you also saw in the, in the former sheets, that there could be a shift or translation uh, between uh, uh, the results of, uh, of the research. 
And there could also be a shift together with a change in the slope uh, of results. And what we have to do is uh, to determine, to do some research, to quantify acceptable tolerances for acceptance or rejection of uh, a completed asphalt work. So thank you very much for listening. Um, feel free to contact us if you have any questions, uh, any ideas, or you feel uh, that, it's, uh, that it's time to join forces. Uh, we will be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Berwich. Thank you so much, Natasha, for this really nice and complete presentation. Right now, it's time for question and answer. If we go to, to our app, Slido, about the question, we are going to, to start by the beginning for the first presentation that has been carried out by Laszlo Peso. For Laszlo, we have some question to be addressed. The first one came from Peter Road. Do you know Mastic Asphalt for Racing Courses, Laszlo? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, um, we do um, uh, manufacture and supply um, Mastic Asphalt. I assume you are asking for uh, about stone Mastic Asphalt. And um, we find that um, Stone mastic asphalt has uh, too much of a uh, matte texture, so we we did uh, talk to um, uh, race drivers. Uh, what is really the requirement for uh, the surface condition? And uh, based on that, uh, we decided not to go down on the pathway of the of the SMA. Um, that's a that's a short answer. Second question is also for Laszlo from Jan Bosquillian. Laszlo, do you also use a coarse aggregate with high resistance to polishing? Uh, yes, all of our asphalt mixes uh, for um, for uh, uh, heavy heavy duty applications. Uh, contain coarse aggregate with a high um, um, uh, PSV, we call it uh, value in Australia, that's, uh, that's, that has to be above 51. So yes, that's, uh, you need it for the micro texture. Tahin Eskander, so, sorry about the family name. Yeah. I cannot pronounce it correctly for through. But Sahin is asking to you also, Laszlo, if you could explain more about the mixture test result. Uh, particularly, he's asking about the temperature where you have obtained in the stiffness modulus 1,800 megapascals. OK. So the, the Australian test method um, uh, requires um, the, the test to be conducted at 25 degree. Um, it is a standardized test, but in uh, Brisbane, in Southeast Queensland, we are using a 32 degree. Uh, that is the uh, weighted pavement annual temperature. And um, if you go to the, to the conference paper, we actually uh, reported both values, but the, the minimum, eight, minimum uh, 1800 um, MPA that relates to the 25 degree. Thanks, and that's a simple resident modulus test. Thanks, Laszlo. The last question that the audience has addressed to you was uh, if it is possible to share the texture depth or a skid resistance uh, of the mixture that you have used, because uh, Itoshi Yamauchi considered that this mixture has a high mastic material content. So in comparison to the core uh, asphalt mixture? Yes. Uh, yes, I can share that. Uh, this uh, this asphalt mix um, has about uh, uh, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 millimeter texture depth. Uh, that's using the Australian. Uh, and it is not a particularly high value. You would be getting more than 1.1 for SMA. But like I said, uh, we did consider 
what would be the, the requirement for racing conditions. And um, it is not only the macro texture which gives you the, the skid resistance, it's also the, the, the micro texture. Uh, so as a combination of the two, uh, this, the, this mix was what we developed for racing condition that provides a, a very good skid resistance. And uh, we talked to drivers, uh, race, uh, race car drivers after the event, and uh, they reported very good grip. So that uh, wasn't a problem. Thank you so much, Laszlo. And especially because of, of your time right now in Australia, I don't know what time is it there. Maybe three or four in the early morning. So Not that bad. Half past one only. <laughs> thank you very much for, for the effort to, to be here with us in this Q&A session. It's uh, a pleasure. Right now, Thanks, Fernando. Right now, we are going to switch to the second presentation that has been carried out by Nicolas. Nicholas, we have one question from an anonymous uh, attendant who is uh, asking about if, if you find the effect also dependent on aggregate type or not. Uh, well, we just analyzed one type of recipe, but uh, I would say yes, the aggregate type will have an effect, the type of aggregate versus the grading curve. Here we have a maximum nominate size of uh, 20 millimeters, a PG 6428. Uh, so, I think the general, yes, aggregate type will have an influence, and especially the recipe, binder type, or filler, uh, filler content, etc. But we didn't test further mixture, we just had this mixture. That was a question that I also have when, when watching your presentation was also. A what about if we change the type of, of asphalt binder, for example, a polymer modified one for a high modulus, uh, reductive uh, thickness yeah. base cores? I would say there is an inference. I think there is a connection with the, maybe with the last question from uh, from Shahin about the methodology, the, the, the void content. Basically, we have in this study, we have a void content, let's say between one and six persons. I guess the trends would be different if we're, let's say, more open graded mixture, but we are considering base cores. So we, between one and six persons, more or less, let's say realistic, but for sure, so for sure, my guess, let's say the recipe, the type of binder, we have an influence, especially what you just say about uh, using high modulus asphalt. I think this can really have an influence. The methodology will remain the same, but I think the trend, we cannot take one-to-one -one this trend and apply it to every asphalt mixture. It will be way too simple, let's say. <laughs> Thanks, Nicholas. One other question from Gian Q. Uh, he said that the observation of the influence of air bullets on the stiffness is interesting and in line with the, our previous observation. And he posed to you a question that, have you looked into the development of the air bullet of samples after the freeze and thaw cycles? Uh, well, first, I'm happy that we get, let's say some similar trends. It's a good news for me or for GenQ, I don't know, for both of us. Um, no, we didn't analyze the, the, the void content on the sample after free so cycle, but this is definitely a point that we're gonna address in future and uh, we're gonna do it. But in, the, in this paper, in this research, we didn't address that point. Thank you so much, Nicolas. Thanks to you. In order to, to, to fulfill all the time of the question, right now we are going to switch for the third presentation, Carrier by Berwich and Natasha. We have one question that is, what about the test for resistance to permanent deformation? Did you already compare field specimen uh, uh, laboratory uh, results? Yes, yes, we did. Um, the nice thing about permanent deformation uh, for us is that in the laboratory, we also uh, we perform triaxial tests. So these are cylindrical specimens, and we can take these cores straight from the road and test them in the triaxial setup. Um, so we can do a direct comparison, and because it's, uh, we can say that uh, permanent deformation tests is type of fatigue, but then in the compression mode. Uh, so we can also analyze with RDEC, but um, in this instance, the triaxial test itself is what causing is 
what is causing a little bit of problem uh, because we need to develop this triaxial test further to make sure that we actually measure permanent deformation correctly. Thanks, Natasha. We have a new question from you. Did you observe any scatter on the ratio of dissipated energy values? Um, yes, we did observe and it, we, we did observe scatter. Um, but what we did in the analysis method is make sure that we uh, add this um, this smoothing uh, smoothing. Uh, yeah, how do you? Procedure? Yes, it's a smoothing procedure that makes sure that we take out any scatter um, that is not significant. Um, and we tried to, um, to change the, uh, how do you, the, 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 fen the fenster. The window? Yes, we, mm -hmm. we, we, we tried to change the window um, of this smoothing uh, action. And we saw that if we uh, if we take a small window or if we take a little bit bigger window, it has almost no effect on the end of life criterion, uh, but it does have effect on the absolute value of the plateau value. Thanks, Natasha. I am sorry that we have no more time for any more question, but anyway, I'm completely sure that Laszlo maybe tomorrow, not tonight, Nicholas, Natasha, and Berwish, uh, we, uh, are, they are going to be happy. If you ask any other question in the networking area, they will be happy to answer that question. So right now we are closing this first Q&A session. Thank you very much, Laszlo. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank you very much, Berwish and Natasha. And we are going to switch on on the second part of this session 3A. During this second part of this session 3A, we are going to have another three interesting presentation. The first one of this session or, or the fourth of the global session is going to be performed by Gustavo Canon. Gustavo Canon holds a master's degree and a PhD from the Technical University of Dresden. He works at the Institute of Payment Engineering at this university and his main areas of interest are numerical modeling of pavement structure and mechanical characterization of asphalt concrete. In the last year, he's becoming a relevant presenter in asphalt congresses and conferences around Europe. His presentation is entitled Optimization of Bitumen Emulsion to Achieve the Best Possible Bone Layer. Dear Gustavo, the floor is yours. Um, hello to everybody. Today, I'm going to talk about optimization of bitumen emulsions to achieve the best possible bond of layers. Uh, the presentation that I'm going to, to show during the next 10 minutes has been mainly prepared by Bettina Gerovsky. Uh, she is also the responsible of all the results that I'm going to show today, as well as the, as the paper that has been written for this conference. Before starting with the presentation, I would like to acknowledge the founding organizations of this project. It has been founded by some organizations here in Germany, and we are working together with a project partner who is a research lab in Germany, who is called Chemisch Technisches Laboratorium Heinrich Hart as well as a lab in Austria that is called Bitunov. So all of this research belong to a research project that is ongoing now here at the Technical University of Dresden. And myself, Gustavo Cano, I'm not exactly working on this project, but I have been an active person in the development of the test device that I'm going to show you in my presentation. So a brief introduction. When we talk about an interlayer bond, we are talking about the connection between the different asphalt layers in flexible pavements. Usually we want a full bonding between the, all the layers in order to have a monolithic structure. When this full bonding does not exist, the whole stress distribution within the asphalt 
payment is reorganized. Here I have a photo, uh, uh, an image where you can where you can see the ideal stress distribution when we have a full bonding. In this case, one of the most common payment stresses is fatigue due to bottom up cracking. However, when we do not have this full bonding, we have this kind of additional problems in the payment. And we could get fatigue cracking not only coming from the bottom layer of the payment, but also for some intermediate layers. For that reason, it's that it is very, very important to determine the layer bond um, between the asphalt layers and to optimize this layer bond in order to avoid this kind of projects that could lead to premature payment failures. We all know that interlayer bonds have been since many years characterized using the Leutner test. However, this test just gives us an indication of the strength of the interlayer area. So it's just a limit value. What we have here in mind in our, in our institute is to, to determine the stiffness of this interlayer bone rather than the strength. For that reason, we have developed a dynamic tester to determine the stiffness of the TAC code that serves as bonding element between the different asphalt layers. Here is a small image of the device that has been developed. It's more or less a shear box that consists of two parts. Uh, as it is observed here schematically. So in one part of the chair box, we have one of the layers of the pavement. In the other part, we have the other, the other layer. And in between, there is a gap where is coming the interlayer area. This gap of the chair box has a thickness or a, it's a, a thickness of one millimeter. So what we do is that one of the layers is kept static, there is no movement, while the other one moves in the vertical direction applying a shear load. And we measure the shear resistance, the shear stiffness of the interlayer area. Here is the, how it looks the testing device within a universal testing machine. So here we have a typical universal testing machine the test device is introduced into the chamber of the universal testing machine and through the piston, the movable part of the chair device applies the load and we measure the deformation and the ratio between deformation and, and load give us an indication of the chair stiffness. Here is the schematic representation of, the, of what I have been talking so far. So at one side, we have the bottom layer. And on the other side of the chair box, there is the top layer. In between, they have, we have the interlayer box, the interlayer area with this chair plane that I said before is one millimeter. We have uh, applied a cyclic load with this vertical piston. However, it is also feasible with this device to apply a normal load. This normal load is quite important in the case to determine interlayer chia effectiveness. Why? Because the interlayer bond is always characterized by two mechanisms, friction between the two asphalt layers and the adhesive effect of the tack code. This friction mechanism is, depends highly on the normal pressure. So by applying this normal load, we could determine this friction coefficient between the asphalt layers. Here is a representation of how it looks the, the specimen. So we have just a, an adapter that is introduced into the device. Inside of the adapter, we have our, our two layer specimen. And then you can see exactly the area of where the interlayer bond is, is in the gap that exists between these two parts of the adapter. The test is done at different temperatures. In this case, four temperatures at different normal stresses. So we apply from 900 kilopascals to four, zero kilopascals and at different frequencies. 
and the results of the tests are the master curves of the interlayer area, as it is shown here. So we have a shear stiffness in terms of independence of frequency, temperature, and normal stresses. These master curves are later on added, in, introduced into a mechanistic payment design that we have developed here using some interface elements. Now I'm going to show more or less the materials that we have done in order to try to optimize this interlayer bond. So we have a, res, a reference bitumen stack code, and we added to this bitumen stack code 10% of mortar and 10% of latex. And we did, we prepared the specimens both in the lab and in a test tray. Here is a photo of the specimens prepared in the lab using a valve sector compactor. And in the test, Track, it was prepared using a specific device in order to apply the tag code, but as well to add the additional, the modifications of the tag code. So here in the right, you may see the addition of the, of the filler, as well as the addition of the latex, the latex uh, particle. The results of of the, of the characterization are the interlayer shear stiffness. I have selected some, or Bettina has selected here some specific, um, some specific results to show more or less the difference in the, of the stiffness, of the interlayer stiffness due to the addition of the mortar or the addition of the latex into the tack code material, as well as the difference of preparing the specimens in the lab are obtaining the specimens for a test track. So here we have the interlayer shear stiffness determined with our device. We see, for example, that the higher the normal stresses, the higher the stiffness. What does it mean? That the friction between the asphalt, the two asphalt layers plays an important role in terms of the resistance to shear deformation. When we have high normal stresses, we have higher friction between the two asphalt loads, and therefore we obtain higher shear stiffness. When the friction, when the normal stress is zero, most of the shear resistance comes from the adhesive effect of the asphalt of the tack code. With that, I end my presentation, saying that we have developed a new testing device to create the to determine the interlayer bond. With this testing device, it was possible to identify the temperature and frequency effects of the shear stiffness of the interlayer area. And by adding some external additives uh, like latex or fine particles, it was possible to optimize the interlayer connection between asphalt layers. Thanks a lot for your attention. And there are questions that we will be happy to answer. Thank you so much, Gustavo. Really nice presentation. Right now we are going to, to pass to the fifth presentation of this session that will be given by Dr. Engineer Johan Blom. Johan research can be divided into several domains, mainly connected to the study of binders, more specific bitumen, cements, and geopolymers, always looking for answers for the behavior of bitumen in materials microscale structure. On a macro scale, his research focus on circular bridge and in maximizing the use of renewable raw materials in new products and upcycling the materials and products currently in use. This research aims to develop a clear tool based on finite element metal on which will, apart from the current codes of good practice, indicate how far a certain design for a cycling bridge adheres to the general concepts of circular economy and how this improves the sustainability. Johan is going to present the determination of bitumen coverage after the rolling bottle test by a digital image processing method. Dear Johan, please, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Johan Blom. I'm a professor at the University of Antwerp and the title of my presentation is Determination of Bitumen Coverage after the rolling bottle test by using a digital image processing method. 
I also like to thank my co-authors Hilde Sunen and Laurent Perrault. To start, I will show you a small uh, overview of my presentation. So I will start with an introduction. I will explain the method, share some results, and um, end up with a conclusion. Um, on this slide, uh, you can see uh, an image of uh, a newspaper published a few weeks ago in Belgium, and uh, you can clearly see uh, some problems with the top layer of the, of the asphalt road. So you see some stripping potholes uh, and uh, chip loss. Um, and the mechanism behind this is uh, the loss of uh, affinity between the bitumen and aggregates leading to uh, degrees of uh, the mechanical strength and uh, reduction of the crack resistance. So uh, you end up with uh, this uh, uh, failure or these um, 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 bad roads. Uh, and so it's a very important to look into the problem of uh, bitumen affinity. Um, so that's uh, something we are going to do in this um, research. The aim of the uh, research is finding a way to determine the bitumen coverage through a digital uh, um, image method uh, in order to increase the reproducibility. Um, you can see here some samples of stones. We use the white stones as a reference, and then you see coated stones. But the problem is with coated stones that, yeah, there is a, um, on the right-hand side, you see an image made by a confocal laser scanning microscope, and you see that bitumen coverage, there is also contamination of bitumen, so a little decoloration. Uh, in normally, or uh, in the standard, the European standard, there is a method to um, 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 examine the um, affinity of um, bitumen to stones by the rolling bottle test. So the test is quite simple. You coat your bitumen, uh, your stones with bitumen, then you separate your stones so that you don't have clusters. You put these stones into these special bottles, you put some water in it, and then you put them for a certain time defined in the Euro code on the rolling bottle machine. Afterwards, you do a visible inspection, and that's where uh, it becomes a little bit tricky. So what you have to do is you have to uh, look at the stones and then observe with or compare them with the degree of particle coating as shown by the uh, image below. Um, this is a very subjective uh, method, so it's uh, really counting on the uh, training of the um, uh, um, the guy who is observing it, uh, and that's problematic. So you can have a large variation in observations. So we started to think about uh, uh, more uh, um, uh, uh, objective method and based on digital image processing. Um, here you can see our setup. So it's a very simple digital camera. We use the uh, uh, LED lighting with different colors to get rid of uh, shadows and to give, uh, get more information out of our images. And we use different kinds of stone. So we use very light stones and very dark stones. Uh, we even use them in dry and wet conditions because you can see that uh, when the stains are, stones are wet, you can see that there is a, a, a darker color and that can make uh, the detection of the uh, bitumen coating a little bit more difficult. So the process is quite simple. Uh, uh, first, we take, of course, the images, then we remove the background, then we separate the um, bitumen from the aggregate, so it means digital, so we uh, uh, do it with thresholding, and then afterwards we know the total stone uh, surface, we know the surface of the bitumen areas, and we can compute the bitumen coverage. Here is an illustration of this method, so schematic, so with a few images. So you see here uh, the image, original image. We remove the background, so we know the contours and the surface of the stones. Then we do a multi-thresh, so we do a, a more advanced uh, thresh holding, and then we can get out the bitumen coverage, and then just by simply dividing the bitumen coverage by the total background, uh, to, uh, to the total so, uh, stone size, we can compute the bitumen coverage. 
Here are some examples of the automated uh, MATLAB program. So uh, again, here we work with thresholding and using different methods, we can define uh, the total stone uh, surface and we can also uh, compute the uh, bitumen coverage uh, uh, according to the different methods. This was the experiment. We used the same stones as uh, in the Rylum uh, round robin. So we used granite, graywick, uh, basalt, and limestone. And you can see uh, really uh, quite well the different uh, uh, colorization or the light stones and the uh, more dark stones. And that uh, also um, challenges our method because the darker stones are, of course, more difficult to separate. Uh, it's more difficult to separate the bitumen and the stone um, um, color. To finalize, you can see here uh, the results. So what we did is after a rolling bottle test, we did a visual uh, inspection using the um, described method in the Eurocode. And uh, you can see here the results. It's only the results of, uh, of the test we did in Antwerp. And then uh, and at the right-hand side, you see the results for um, the digital image processing method. It's clear that uh, the results are uh, uh, comparable, but for the DIP method, which is more uh, uh, um, um, uh, objective, you can see that there is a less standard deviation, so it's more repeatable. And that was a little bit the aim of our um, um, experiment. To finalize, um, you can see that the method is working. It works very well for uh, um, light to moderate dark, uh, so that you have an, a nice contrast between the bitumen and the stone. It becomes a little bit more problematic for dark stones, but we found or we are doing additional research on that. And we are working, for instance, with uh, uh, multispectral cameras and different lightings or different uh, uh, separation techniques. So we see uh, a bright future for this uh, uh, novel development in order to detect in a more objective way the bitumen coverage of, uh, uh, bitumen, uh, of uh, stones. Thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I will be delighted to answer them. Thank you very much, Johan. Last but not the least, we are going to have a presentation performed by Laurent Porot. Laurent has a master's degree in civil engineering from the Ecole Nationale de Pont et Chaussée de France. With 30 years of experience, he has capitalized a worldwide expertise on payment engineering with payment design, material, young works, and research and development. We can say that he is right now a reference in the sector. Currently, Lauren is market development manager at Kraton in charge of technical development of polymer and pine chemical additives in payment and roofing application. He's also an active member of Relin since 2004, where he has been involved in different technical committees. Today, he's going to present the outcome from the Relin technical committee uh, on the affinity between aggregates and bituminous binder as interlaboratory study. Dear Lauren, the floor is yours. Thanks. Muchas gracias, Fernando. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to present you some outcomes from the RIL MTC 237 SIB, and more specifically from the TG1 on affinity between aggregates and bituminous binder. It perfectly echoes and complements the previous presentation from Johan. I would like to acknowledge my co-author for this specific paper, Hilde from Minas, Alex from East London University, James, now at EARD in Australia, Stefan from the Belgium Road Research Center, and Emmanuel from the Young University du Savefer. And of course, all participant members of the RAL MTC. Asphalt payment is a durable material for roads that ensure ad hoc surface condition for safe and reliable drive. It provides also waterproof cover for the subgrade soil and embankment to ensure reliable and long-term bearing capacity. This is valid statement unless the surface and materials keep their integrity. And water can be seen as the enemy number one for roads, causing raveling, shipping loss, 
and further in the damage process portals, up to some extreme case when the pavement or the road could totally collapse. As already discussed earlier in the session, the interaction between the aggregates and bitumen in presence of water is key. There are many different factors influencing this interaction, such as, but not limited, the weather conditions with obviously rainfall, but as, a, as well freeze for cycles, warm temperatures, the way pavement and materials are designed, an open graded mix will be more subject to water integration than dense asphalt. And of course, the type and nature of the constituent, some aggregates being more sensitive to water than other mix. Maybe first, uh, some few words on RILEM. The RILEM stands for Réunion Internationale des Experts et Laboratoires en Matériaux, an international organization for experts and laboratories on materials. It is organized in clusters, and the cluster F is dedicated to bitumen binder and polymers. Each cluster has some technical committees, usually active for five to six years. The aim of the RILEM TCs is to share best practice and through some interlaboratory experiment to come with recommendations that can be used for standardization, all these activities being on voluntary basis. The TC 237SIB was on testing and characterization of sustainable innovation between these materials and systems and was active from 2010 until 2017. It had five task groups with task group one looking after the binder scale and more specifically on interaction between aggregate and bitumen binder. All the results were published in a state-of-the-art report. You can have access via the QR code just above. Let's go through the experimental plan. For the material, three different bitumen were used, two bitumen different sources graded as 50-70, and a polymer modified bitumen graded as 45-80-60. Four different types of aggregates from various nature, selected to have different colors and water sensitivities, based on the differences in the mineralogy and composition. In terms of testing, a wide range of tests were included, depending on the experience and capability of each lab. Affinity between aggregates and bitumen was assessed mostly for three tests, the common rolling bottle test according to EN 12697.11, clause five, the boiling water stripping test according to EN to the same standard, clause seven, and the bitumen bond test strength according to ESTM D451. In total, 13 different labs participated in this experiment with uh, seven different tests. Some further fundamental testing were also performed by some labs that won't be discussed here today. Here are the main results for the rolling bottle test. It consists in rolling in water pre-coated aggregates fully immersed in the water and the test run at ambient temperature. After a certain time, the remaining bitumen coating is visually evaluated. The test was run for six hours and 20 hours, even for some aggregates up to 72 hours. The test was the most popular one and run by eight laboratories, generating 192 values. As you can see on the graph here, there was a high level of variability between labs, especially for the intermediate and low values. We can argue the results are coming from visual observation and may introduce a human factor. Sometimes Friday afternoon observation are more relaxed than Monday morning. Definitely automatic image record may improve the reading. On the other hand, as some labs took some pictures, it was also possible to see that for the same combination of aggregates and bitumen between labs, Results were very different as shown in the pictures here. Overall, the results after 24 hours appear to be more discriminant, and the aggregates had the main greatest impact on the result. Now are the results for the water stripping test. In this test, 
coated aggregates are immersed in water and the water boiled for 10 minutes. At the end of the test, the degree of bitumen coating is addressed by tit titration with an acid or base using calib calibration curve. All four visual observations can be done as well. Only three lab laboratories perform this test. As you can see in the graph here, there was still high variability in the result, especially for the worst results. And again, the type of aggregates had the greatest impact on the results. The true need bitumen 5070 gave very similar outcomes, while for the PMB, it gave slightly better results in the worst case with the granite. This may ring the bell that as the, as the temperature goes up to 100 degrees Celsius, above the softening point, the viscosity of the binder may have an impact as well. And the last series of the test was on the bitumen bond training, also known as the PATI test. It's a test more popular in North America and adapted from the paint and coating industry. The test consists on a bond between the aggregate substrate made from bulk stone with a binder under controlled conditions and temperature and humidity. This request requires to polish the stone to have a smooth and plain surface. The binder is bonded with a various stub, which is pulled off during the test and the force recorded. Comparison between dry and wet conditions was used as a result. For this test, only three lamps performed this test. As previously noted for the other test, a high variability in results were, was observed, especially for the worst case. The preparation of the stone substrate, if it's enough smooth or coarse, may have an impact on the result. During the test, the surface of the pool of section provides also indication of the type of the failure. Most often, it combines both adhesion and cohesion. These are the main outcomes of this interlaboratory experiment. At comparing the different methods, it is worth to see that within the nine lamps involved, the rolling bottle test was the most common one. It is easy and convenient to perform. Also, a bit empirical record of results with the visual observation. The water stripping is also an easy test and seems to be more accurate using titration approach, but needs as well reactive agents that may explain less common than the bottle test. And for the bond strength, it requires bulk stone and special preparation for the substrate, which result combine both uh, adhesion and cohesion. Overall, the aggregate had the greatest influence on the bitumen, the, the lowest. When comparing each test together, they did not necessarily provide the same result and ranking, as you can see in the table here. Granite was definitely providing the worst results. For intermediate results, such as basalt and greywack, ranking was different. Even in the case of stripping tests, basalt was ranked as excellent, better than limestone. In conclusion, in a world with more impact from climate conditions through climate change, it's key for the asphalt industry to adequately address and assess uh, the impact of water damage. Within this relay, real RILEM activities, with nine laboratories, affinity evaluation of aggregates and bitumen binder was not a straightforward path. And the different tests lead to very different results with high level of variability. The results were impacted more by the type of aggregate and less by the bitumen. However, certainly the viscosity can play a role here. This can be affected as well by the degree of aging. The final recommendation was to con consider the result by classes, excellent, good, fair, or poor, rather than absolute value. A more qualitative assessment than quantitative and predictive, predictive evaluation. If you want to learn more on the experiment and the outcomes, you can read the recommendation that was published, and you can have access via the QR code here. 
And if you have any specific questions, more than happy to answer at the end of the session or during the poster session. Many thanks for your attention. Merci bien. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Laurent. And congratulations for this impeccable presentation. Time now for, for the second part of question and answer session, according to, to this last three presentation. If we go to, to the Toledo, um, I'm going to, to start by the fourth presentation of this session that has been carried out by Gustavo Canon. We have several questions addressed to him. The first one from Martin Huener. Gustavo, what is the precision of the test method? Uh, okay, can you listen to me? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, ah, okay. Well, the precision of the test method depends, of course, of course, of the um, on the instrument on the instrumentation that you are using. I mean, we are usually using a um, linear vertical transducers, um, but the main lack of precision that we are facing up to now is not too much into the instrumentation related, but in the weight of the preparation of the specimen because this one millimeter gap that I was talking about needs to be very precise um, fitted. If we go a little bit more or a little bit less, then the precision of the, of the results will be jeopardized. So in order to improve the, the precision, we are more focusing on optimizing the way of, that we are preparing the, the specimens rather than in adding more precision into the instrumentation. Thank you, Gustavo. We have more question, one more question from Francisco Guisado that he's asking to you that if you can tell us what type of referring emulsion have you used? What type of base bitumen do the emulsion use, hard or soft? Uh, we are here in residence so in Germany. We usually use emulsion based on a bitumen of penetration grade 5070. However, we have also done some tests using emulsion with soft bitumens aiming to, ex to use this device also in more Northern countries. Like uh, if I have here uh, 160, 220 penetration grade bitumens, so soft bitumens. But we usually focus on a penetration grade of around 50, 70. Good, thank you so much, Gustavo. And we have two more anonymous question but they are asking to you if you are considering standardizing your method and introducing it into the asphalt meter specification. And if you have tried to compare the performance of using that code, uh, bond code, please. Uh, that code and, and bond code. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't really understand. We usually use this, this as the same word, that code or bond code. Yeah. I, I can imagine if bone code maybe is without the tap code, just the friction. Yeah, if it is yeah. like this, we have we have tried to, to see how is the, the interlayer bone without using tap code. And we have seen that sometimes it is not needed the tap code. And the other one, if we are planning to standardize, standardize it, yeah, we are going into that direction. Yeah, um, we are mainly focusing on trying to obtain material parameter that can be used within mechanistic payment design. And, and if it is possible in the future, we would like to standardize it. Actually, there are already several universities using this device as well as here in Germany and also in Switzerland. And I think Austria as well. So there are some promising results. Thanks. Thank you so much, Gustavo. We are going to switch to the fifth presentation, uh, switch to Professor Johan Blom. Professor Johan, uh, an anonymous question asked to you is, do you need expensive software and camera to perform the digital analysis? No, you don't need um, expensive software. There is uh, even some uh, freeware like ImageJ where you can um, just uh, do some thresholding. But okay, if you want to program it to make it more effective, we use now MATLAB, but I think we also can use, for instance, uh, a JavaScript or so that uh, at the end, we want to have a, a portable uh, solution 
that you can use, for instance, on a mobile phone. That's one of the ideas. So um, the cameras in mobile phones, they are um, uh, good enough to, to, to make these images. And um, so that's one of the things we are thinking about to, to make it um, as easy as possible so that you can use it uh, with your mobile phone. That could be one solution. The other solution is um, to use it um, on, on large patches because you always sample a small amount of stones. So we want to make it uh, even possible to use it on large batches. And then you, of course the investment in the cameras should be a little bit more expensive because then you need high speed imaging. And then you can uh, also not only uh, determine the coverage of the bitumen, but also stone shape or stone variation. And it could be very interesting for instance, for wrap for recycled asphalt pavement, where you are interested not only in the amount of coating or amount of bitumen on the space on the on the granulate, but also on the, the change of the, the stone uh, size and the stone form. So um, we are also looking into that. Thank you very much, Professor. Really clear in the answer. Another question addressed to you from Stefan is what is the basis for determining the threshold values? We use some uh, calibration sheets. So we uh, started to, to work with uh, uh, computer uh, um, generated images. So where we exactly know what the gray values were and where the coverage degree was. So a little bit what is in the standard, you also have these standard um, figures in order to have a calibration. So we made them also for um, with different sizes, with different coverage degrees and different gray values. And we op optimized, for instance, background color, lighting, and um, the, the, yeah, the procedure of uh, thresholding because we use, there are a lot of different thresholding methods. And um, so we optimize it by uh, generating uh, numeric numerical uh, images um, where we pr really precisely know what, what the coverage degree was. Thank you so much, Professor. I know that we have some more questions also from Gustavo Canon and, and from Professor Johan Blom, but because of the time, we are going to switch to the last presenter, to Laurent Porot. Uh, the first question that has been addressed to Laurent came from Vincent, and he's asking if, are there any study of how well the various affinity tests in the laboratory relate to long-term weathering on site where the asphalt is subjected to repeated wetting and drying over time? Uh, thank you, it's a, it's a very good question. This is not something which was uh, considering in this uh, uh, run run test with the RILM because we mostly stick in fact to uh, European standards and to try to evaluate more the variability of these standards. But it's a good point and uh, behind in fact the, the, weather, the weather conditions, maybe as well to investigate the aging stage can be a good path for research. Thank you so much, Laura. This question, it's going to be addresses for Laurent, but also for Johan. It came yeah. from an anonymous attendant. And he's asking if, do you believe the aggregate shape and texture can also have an impact in the rolling bottle test in regard the coating after atritium? Please, Laurent, for you. Yeah, that's something we, we have seen as well, and we work closely with uh, Johan, even if, if we are, in fact, uh, almost neighbors. Um, what is interesting to investigate after the rolling bottle test is just to have a look to the, to the aggregate itself. And sometimes you see that uh, the corners are aggregate, they are polished. So there may be, in fact, a double effect with uh, removing the film of bitumen and as well, in fact, abrasion of the aggregates for that. But when you do observation, visual observation, yeah, you just report the, the, the degree of coating. Maybe there is much more learning on that. And maybe Johan, you can comment a little bit on that. Yes, uh, that's that's what I showed in the picture with the yeah. confocal laser scanning microscope because it's very difficult to determine if it's really a coating or it's a contamination because also the yeah. porosity of the stone and um, the polishing uh, of the stone.
can really affect it. So if, if you do, for instance, uh, the titration, yeah, it can be that it's not really a coating, but more a contamination. So it's, it's very difficult to say what is now effective, uh, an effective coating, which will be um, the bond of the, of the granulate and what is now a contamination and which is just covering the stone and it's not um, essential in, uh, or it, it's not uh, uh, beneficial for, for the structural uh, uh, performance of, of the, the asphalt. So um, the definition of coating is something um, really difficult to say what is coating and what is, uh, what is contamination. But with confocal laser, with, with our new equipment, we can really measure thicknesses of coatings and, and we can uh, then um, also take that in account. Thank you very much, Laurent. Thank you, Professor. I know that we have so many more questions about the presentation that have been carried out, but because of the time, we, can, uh, we must stop here. But anyway, and uh, as I said in the last Q&A session, I'm completely sure that Gustavo, Laurent, and Johan will be more than happy to answer that question in the networking area and even to establish new discussion about this really interesting presentation that we have had in this session 3A. From my point, from here, from the share of that session, that's only I want to say Thank you very much to all the speakers, to all the presenters for the really clear, nice presentation. Thank you so much to, to the Kenneth Crew for solving the issues that we have had at the beginning of the session and the professionally. And for sure, thank you very much for these more than 300 people that has been connected and has attended to this session. Thank you very much to all of you. And I hope that we can carry on enjoying this incredible Congress, even in this virtual version. Cross finger for the next one will be live in person version of the Congress for so all. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Fernando. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.